I thought it would be really interesting to to show different ways to start improvising simply and then get more complicated. Okay, this is what we can call deeper in the pool. So there, one of the things with improvisation that's extremely helpful is to have just some kind of guiding concept uh, for your creation. It's, a, it's always spontaneous and anything can happen, but it's also nice to have certain general ways to develop things that you're aware of uh, because it helps to give shape and structure to uh, your playing. When, when I would say, it, uh, it's common when people improvise to just do kind of whatever, like, just kind of do whatever comes. Now, on some level, that's, of course, what we're doing when we improvise. But it's, it's better to have some type of a template where you have some ways that you, you know you're going to develop things. And so this, this really helps if you're doing a whole solo or if you're doing a, in a group or a solo performance, either way. So that's what we're going to talk about right now. So we're going to start, uh, I'm going to take it step by step into the pool. We'll start on the, the, the shallow, we'll start on not even in the pool really. We'll start on the steps. Uh, so we're going to take uh, all the things you are, and we're going to just play the melody. So we're going to start on the very, very first part of the improv pool, which is the melody. So Charlie and I are going to play the melody, and then we're going to stop. <laughs> That's the, the stairs in the pool. The first step into the pool we can think of as embellishing the melody. Now this is not this is this is a, a practical type of a template that can take you step by step into improv. It's nothing that has to be followed in stone. It can be followed more or less in stone when you solo, and it will sound great if you do it. Uh, a lot of times we don't want to be that regimented. But it's just something to keep in mind and adapt. Some of these improv concepts that you can use when you're playing, they, they sometimes can be, you can keep them like over your head, like here, and you can just dip into them anytime you want to. And anytime you, you don't want to go with it, you, you just go with whatever's occurring to you, to you at the moment. But have this little umbrella on top of your head of concepts for development. And you can follow that umbrella a little bit or exactly or a lot but it, it's a beautiful safety net when it comes to improv okay so the first degree of going into the pool would be embellishing the melody so uh, my teacher Charlie Banakis used to say that this was being loosey-goosey with the melody so usually when we embellish the melody we'll usually add to it okay now, there's two basic kinds of, of things you can do. You can do addition or you can do subtraction. Thelonious Monk did both. He did a lot of subtraction. So he would make a phrase, ba do 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 da do 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 dee da ba do 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 da do 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 da ba da 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 He would take notes away from it a lot. Unusual. Most of the time when we embellish the melody, we'll add notes to it. 
And a lot of times you can add um, neighbor notes to the melody, just notes that are close to the melody notes. And it should be something, the, the embellishing of the melody is not something that's mathematical. It's something that um, is totally feeling. So one way you can get a feel for embellishing the melody is to listen and sing with Louis Armstrong because he was fantastic at that. He would never play a melody totally straight, but he would always tweak it. And uh, when you're improvising, you could potentially play the melody straight, and then the second chorus could be embellishment if you wanted to. Or you could start right off into embellishment. Okay, So we're going to demonstrate now embellishing the melody, which is usually a question of using what we call musical addition to add to the notes. You. <laughs> So in terms of, that's a very interesting kind of approach to the melody. Um, 
It can be as simple as hitting a note twice to get an embellishment or playing a, a little turn, like a classical turn. And I can also use the principle of um, imitation. So once I develop a little embellishment, I can use it again. That works real nice. <laughs> On piano, you can change things like, for example, the way you're playing the melody. So maybe we could do octaves. Maybe double stops. Or maybe I could do like a block chord thing. things can just add character to the melody and that's something that's a, that's kind of shallow pool improvising but it's a lot of fun and you can always come back to that even when you're in a complicated part of your solo you can come back to embellishing a melody and bring the listener more or less back to where you started which is a nice thing to do when you're already uh, into it okay so our next concept will be creating a new melody so this is, uh, the characteristics of most melodies is that it's just a few notes, simple phrase, and a held note at the end that holds for a while, okay? It's the, it's the held note at the end of a short phrase that is typical of a melody. So here, okay, so there's that note holds. That's characteristic of a melody as opposed to a jazz line, which is something different. So you can create a new melody, which is uh, generally going to be kind of short phrases with held notes at the end. And we can use imitation on this. So this is another beautiful thing to do with improv. We, I, I call it creating a new melody.
Dave, I've got a question uh, about the phrasing. Um, yeah. I'm, I'm trying to under, you know, I'm trying to take listen closely and hear what's happening. So I'm hearing some like repetition of some sort of phrasing mm -hmm. happening between phrases, like not exactly, but the same sort of thing going on. And then uh, it seems like maybe the contours of the phrases are are sort of uh, similar from one to another. So there's not like a sudden jarring change. I'm, 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 is, is that the sort of thing we should okay. be thinking about? The whole trip with improvising, and Bill Evans used to say this was his, the major thing that he was trying to figure out with improvisation was why does phrase B follow phrase A, okay? So if you're having a conversation with somebody, it's really important that, you know, the phrases follow each other naturally, right? Same with music. So there's, there's two general ways to think about this. One is to think that you're having a conversation either be, with yourself or between two people. When you're playing, you can think, think that you're having a conversation between two people, that one is answering the other, okay? So it's it makes it, that just connects. If I think that I'm just thinking conversationally, another way to say that is what feels like it's it wants to come naturally next? It just knocks at your door most of the time, okay? Now, there doesn't have to be necessarily any particular relationship between the phrases. It's possible. If you think conversationally, then it will generally sound like the phrases work with each other, but they don't have to be exact. So I'll show you, I'll give you an example of this. It's just thinking that, like I'm thinking of a conversation. Yeah, that sounded great. Kind of um, now, but wait, there's another. That's the first oh, okay. thing. The, the other thing, there's a principle of improvisation called imitation, okay? This is not only a principle in, uh, in improvisation, it's a principle in creating music of any type, whether you're composing or improvising or whatever. Now, imitation is using... It's like theme and variation, okay? It's something very specific. It's something that you will do specifically when you're improvising for a period of time. And this is one way to develop what you're playing. 
So there are two basic forms of imitation. The first is what we call perfect imitation, and the second is what we call imperfect imitation. Okay, very interesting. Perfect imitation, this is what you were asking, Ed. Perfect imitation is when you play the same exact phrase from a different note. Okay, now that's going to work. That's going to work sometimes, or it will work a lot of times. Uh, it's to your discretion. But e exactly imitating your phrase is, is something that will, will definitely give yourself and the listener something to hang their hat on, you know? They could hear, they can hear it, they can, they can understand it, you know? Which is, which is good. So, for example, perfect imitation... This is what we call perfect imitation. Might be in a way yeah. Actually, I'm thinking yeah. like that would be a great way to just get started if you're, you know, if you're really trying to just get off the ground, right? Absolutely. And okay. now, I mean, the most famous kind of perfect imitation is bam, 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 blah, 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 blah. Perfect imitation. Now, Here's a really, really cool concept when it comes to Im imitation. The question is, how long do you imitate an idea for? How long do you vary it? The answer is, you will get a, uh, a signal from the, from the little person in your head when the phrase is played out. It's not necessarily, you, you don't want to say it'll be two times or three times or four times. It, it generally you want to do it a couple of times because that's what will drive the phrase home to the listener. But you you get the, you get a very definite signal if you listen and if you program the little person in your head who's listening the improv uh, traffic cop. Say I want to know when my f perfectly imitated phrase is finished. You're going to get a very strong uh, signal. Done. Okay, let me show you that. And I'll, t I'll tell you what I'm hearing. A little bit more. Again. One more time. There, I would say it's done. From there you can go into an eighth note line.
that? Yeah, okay. that's great. Yeah, thanks right. for uh, thanks for bringing me back to the instinctive method versus the you know logical method. <laughs> uh, Dave, yeah, uh, yeah. Um, you, uh, I had a senior moment. So you talked about Bill Evans, and then uh, he had two tricks. One is imitation. What, was something before well, that you mentioned? Well, okay. So the so there the two general big concept ways you can think of one phrase naturally following the next is the first way is to is to think conversationally okay. when you're playing. Think in like you're talking. Okay. Okay. Musical phrases, right? And that if you think that, it should work out that one phrase will naturally follow another. The other ways where we're talking about imitation are very okay. specific ways, right? Okay. Now, you can use all of this. You can use all of it and more, as much or as little as you want. It's totally, you know, it's a blank canvas, which is, you know, the greatest thing about this whole thing. Now, sure. I want to go one step further into the pool. The other kind of imitation is called imperfect imitation. Yes. It's very, very interesting. So imperfect imitation is... You're imitating or echoing the phrase you played before, but you're not doing it perfectly. You're making some alteration. Now, the alteration, this was your question, Ed. The alteration can be lots of things. It could be you could add notes to your original phrase. You could take notes away from your original phrase. And one fun practice routine is to actually try this specifically when you practice try creating a phrase imitate it perfectly for a while just as an exercise or try playing a phrase and adding notes to it and then maybe try playing a phrase and then the same thing but take away notes from it so adding addition subtraction is one way you can change the intervals between the notes that's a good way to to vary uh, a phrase you can definitely vary the rhythm okay so I can make the I can just change the rhythm make notes faster make the notes slower uh, you can change the direction of the notes so if one note goes up to another note then this when you repeat the phrase it will have certain characteristics of the phrase but the second note will go down instead of up okay now, the trick to imperfect imitation is that the listener has to hear that there's still a relationship between the two phrases. There has to be enough similarity that the listener will say, "I'm, I'm following this. You know, this is, uh, this is. I hear how how you're varying it." Okay, and so this is a very, very interesting uh, thing. So I'll demonstrate some of this.
Catch that? Yeah, Dave, related to what you're saying is phrase length, too. I've noticed, you know, you, you increased phrases or lessened them. So that's a related yeah, right. concept. So, right? You know, you can, you can repeat the, the animal but add a tail to it. Yes, yes. You know what I mean? Yes, definitely mm -hmm. phrase lengths is one of the things that will, you know, uh, make it so that you make, you'll, you'll create an inherent connection between the phrases, right? Yeah, there's a book out, I forget, uh, a sax player did it, uh, and you can embed the melody, you know, within a, within a note, within a scales or whatever, em embedding, you know what I embedding. mean? Embedding? Yeah, you would embed. What does that mean? Well, you know, all the things you are, you might want to play, you know, uh, uh, first five notes of an F minor scale, you're, you're still including the A flat, you know, the beginning note. Okay. You're, you're embedding that within. Oh, you mean line. you're embedding, em, embedding the melody note? Yes. And then you're within, then you're within yeah, yeah, a scale you're or arpeggio. You just you, cut, uh, you hit you, it's embedded within. I don't know if you yeah ever thought about yeah. that. Uh, yeah, the whole thing that we've been doing so far today is all based on all the things you are. Yeah. Right. Right. It's our tune for, tune du jour. We. Oui. Um, yeah. Keith, do you have a question? I see a question from Keith. Uh, yeah, well, question and comment. First of all, I, I really like that spot right at the end of what you just played, where you'd been leaving a lot of space between your phrases, and then all of a sudden you played a bunch of four-bar phrases without any pause. It was just, it was a nice contrast and unexpected. Right, right before you started singing uh, Beethoven, I'd actually been thinking about Beethoven for a moment. Because um, when you talked about all these ways you can take a phrase, repeat it, change it a little bit, you know, change the harmony, change the rhythm, change the dynamics. I've, I've been listening to Beethoven recently and it seems like he's a yeah. real master of that. I'm Taking sure. one phrase and just on and on and on. Well, take that symphony, right? Ba -da -ba -da. Yeah. And he imitates it yeah. perfectly. Ba -da -ba -da. And then he doubles it. Da 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 da. And then he repeats that. Da 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 da. Then he keeps the same rhythm. Ba da da da. Then he imitates that. Ba da da da. Da 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 da. Pam pam. That whole first section is based on ba da da da. And then he changes it there. Da di 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 da da da. Then he imitates that. Bo di yo do di da da da. Yeah. He definitely had this in his toolkit. <laughs> yeah. So yeah. Do, you, do you find it useful to listen to music from, from them to oh, man. get ideas it's, for how you play? Oh, yeah. Absolutely. What do you yeah. think, Charlie? Yes, for sure. Tell, yeah. how, how, how do you do that in terms of listening? I do a lot of it on YouTube. Okay. Um, I just... I just listen. I don't try to analyze all that much. Okay. But somehow, I think I'm able to work it, some of it into my improvising. Okay. I think listen to the uh, two two part fugues of Bach. Uh, invent the Bach inventions are very good. Two and three part inventions and the fugues for keyboard. It's all over the place. Yeah. 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 Oh, absolutely. I mean, you but you'll find this imitation thing everywhere in terms of composed music and improvised music too. Uh, but different players do it more or less. For example, Charlie Parker didn't do that all that much. That wasn't one of his big things. He would usually give you different uh, different information in phrase B than phrase A. But Bill Evans uses imitation constantly. Uh, everything he's, uh, I mean, not everything, but constantly he's using sometimes perfect, sometimes imperfect imitation. He likes setting up a phrase and then speeding it up, which is really a lot of fun. So, uh...
And it's partially the reason he does that, I think, is because he wanted his music to be very accessible to everybody. Somebody like, uh, you know, Lenny was not so interested in uh, that kind of general uh, kind of uh, listenability. But somebody like Bill, I think he understood that his function was to be a f famous and to really, you know, bring music to the, to the, the public in, en masse. So that's why he would use some principles that people can get a hold of and, and make sense of. Uh, I saw, okay, Dave and I saw a full, full orchestra do the symphony. Yeah, right. Yeah, that's incredible. That's incredible. Uh, is that answer your question there, Ed? Oh, absolutely, and much more. Thank you. Yeah, so, so the thing is, principle number one of improvisation is... Anything done too long becomes boring. Okay? Anything done too long becomes boring. You could have the greatest... That's why Charlie Parker... And I remember I asked Lenny Tristano this question once. I said... Uh, I was learning about... He was Lenny was teaching me about the different phrases and the different... Uh, different speeds and different rhythms. And... I noticed that Charlie Parker would would not use a lot of the double time lines, the sixteenth lines. He would just use it really sparingly. And obviously he could have used it. Now somebody like Coltrane uses the the sixteenth lines all over the place. Even on really simple tunes like uh you know, like um uh So What or the stuff he did with Miles. Colt Miles would be doing very long. Miles was creating new melodies, like we were discussing, all over the place. And then Coltrane came in with the 16th lines, boom, right away, and kept it going. That's just a different style. But Lenny said that you're supposed to generally hold off on the 16th notes until you're you're you know, you're, you're looking for the right spot. So I mean, if Muhammad Ali was was in a ring, he wouldn't come out and just start punching everything. Everything was strategic. He would wait, and at the right moment, then he would do it. So Lenny said, uh, uh, you know, you, you, you want to wait to use the, the higher artillery. You know? And so that works pretty good. Okay, and I've been more and more aware that the masters often use very simple principles, but apply them in creative and interesting ways. Yeah, it cuts across the, you know, it cuts across the spectrum. Sometimes it's very simple. Depends on the player, too. Some some players like, you know, I mean, like Coltrane, for example, was was never very simple. He was always working in complication, more or less. Somebody like Miles was working mostly in simplicity. Uh, you know, some guys could do both. Um, so yeah, I mean, it's again, it's a personal style. But you know, it's just learning these different possibilities. And these different concepts of approaching improvisation, it's so useful when you do it to have some of these concepts working for you, because it it, it really makes the process a lot a lot clearer, and um, it, it, I find it just works better. So there's, you can argue that point, but anyway, okay, uh, let's go a little further. So now we're going to demonstrate. So what we've done so far is we've done the melody. We've done an, an embellished melody. That would be like the first step into the pool. We did a new melody. That would be the second step in the pool. We did... Uh, that's, it. That's, that's, it. that's it so far, right. So now we're going to get into the jazz lines, which is the eight, the swing eighth line. Okay. The eighth note line is the backbone of jazz playing and jazz phrasing. And so uh, a lot of times, it depends on the player, it depends on the situation. A lot of times you won't necessarily start a solo with this eighth note line, but definitely once you got into the solo, you would probably use a lot of it, depending on who you were. So Art Tatum didn't use any of this eighth note line. It was all 16th and 30 seconds and all that. Uh, but Powell used tons of eighth note lines. It's up to you, but but it's good to know the different possibilities. So now we're just going to demonstrate a swing eighth note free line. This is the first place 
where we're breaking free from the melody totally. We're not thinking of the melody anymore. We're trying to just flow and get the get the melodies to 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 appear as we play, which is the great part of this. Now we're going to take, go further into the pool. Uh, so the next thing is to use triplets. I'm not going to put anybody on the spot to do this. I will put myself on the chopping block. Maybe I can pull it off. So the next line would be triplets. Okay, now I can either use triplets in the middle of the eighth note line or alone and create a line of triplets. This would be the next level of intensity. So let's just say we put a triplet in the line. The triplet picks. 
takes the line ahead a little bit. So now we're going to put it all together. Thank you for listening. Um, one uh, it goes to your question. Uh, some, somebody just asked Charlie, uh, what do you listen for or, or like that? I mean, that's one of the real fun parts about all this is that it's, uh, I find it like super fun to listen to players and and you can listen almost with a filter of looking for some of these concepts because they're going to be there and different players to more or, uh, more or less degrees you know everyone is different but you're going to hear how different players use these basic kind of approaches and how they develop their playing and you can learn so much from that uh, and it's just it's just great now one of the things primary thing is that Generally speaking, when we're talking about general jazz improvisation, we can always do something completely different. But when we're talking about just general jazz improv, the eighth note line is the center of it all. So we want to develop to get up to that eighth note line. Once we're at the eighth note line, it's like cruising altitude in a plane. Like you, you, start, you start on the tarmac and you go up, you go up, you go up to cruising altitude. That's the eighth note. Once you're in cruising altitude, you stay there for a while. You cruise. And then it can go higher. Then you go up and higher. And then you come down to it. So if you think of the eighth note line as the kind of glue that holds it all together, that's a really good way to put it together. Okay? So I, I'm going to get signals like, uh, you know, get more intense now. Go faster. Uh, enough of this uh, rhythm or enough of this phrase um, and then then you'll go into whatever you want to go into you go a anywhere but then pretty soon I'll get that little creep in my head telling me all right go back to the eighth note now okay because that's what holds it all together okay and again it depends on the player all right so we're going to uh, play a whole arrangement of this and we'll just we'll just use all these things however they come <laughs> 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 
I heard.
que ellos venden. So I can see the step on TV. It becomes natural. I see LeBron James. It's not, it's not out of the ordinary. It's something they have to do. complete little presentation there. <laughs> Next time we'll talk about the proper way to do a lobotomy. <laughs> I'll, I'll try it on Charlie. <laughs> okay. I want to thank you all for coming. Uh, such a beautiful thing to me, I'm sure to you too, that's why you're here, is that we can just be sitting here, basically nothing is happening, and we can all of a sudden, as Bill Evans said, flip, slip, flip a switch. And then all of this music can just, just come from nowhere. And uh, every time we do it, it's totally different. And I mean, there are similarities, but it's, it's completely different music. And it's totally there to express whatever you want to express in the moment. And uh, the, my great teachers who taught me how to do this uh, they were giving me the keys to the kingdom, really. And uh, I've been able to spend, and as well as Charlie and all, all his jazz musicians and a lot of you folks, just cr spend our whole lives creating new music. And that is something else. It's uh, really a gift. So it really means a lot to share it with you. Uh, if you have any uh, questions, uh, Charlie, you sounded great today, man. Thank you. Let's hear it for Charlie. Any questions? Any questions for Charlie? Yeah, it's not every day, man, you get to sit around and listen to this. Yeah, Leo, go ahead, man. Oh, no, oh, just clapping. He's clapping. Just he clapping. Great sound, great music. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Bravo, Charlie. That's what somebody said. Thanks, Prof. Okay. All right. So uh, almost all of the classes that we've done, this is, I don't know, maybe the 25th or 26th class. Can you believe that? Uh, all, almost all of them are on Vimeo in, in their entirety, the good, the bad, and the ugly, and the chatting, and the 
inane comments and everything. Uh, they're on, uh, you can access any of them. Uh, you can type in the title D-F-S-O-J-O, -O, Dave Frank School of Jazz Online. Uh, just capital letters, D-F-S-O-J-O. -O, and that is also the password. Thank you. Thank you, Harry. D-F-S-O-J-O. -O, right. That's it right there. And uh, this is session 34. Oh, my God. Yikes. Okay. Uh, they're all there. Well, not all. Maybe 30. I don't know. There's plenty. There's plenty. There's much more than anybody needs. But they are there. So um, thank you all for participating. Um, if you have any friends or colleagues or enemies that you think would enjoy joining us, feel free to invite them. It's open for everybody. We want to spread this as much as we can. And it means a whole hell of a lot to me that you guys showed up and we can have these afternoons. Absolutely great. Blessings and keep swinging. <laughs>